students why this topic and how did you bring it forward? Well, because there is no money available to open mass graves, but for any project related to historical memory. How did you manage that? Well, in 2010, we did a documentary. We made a documentary about the historical memory, where we had the narration of a family about their experience during this civil war and the uh, repression post-war. And then, at the time, we reflected or we showed what the what happened with the, with the state at that time, the actual war, and what happened afterwards. This is a really good explanation of the actual historical processes and the repercussions up until today. When in 2012, the Commission for the Recovery of Historical Memory suggested or proposed that to make another documentary on historical memory, the challenge then was the approach that we wanted to give to it. So we found that there was something that was not, um, uh, or resource that has not been used before, that is to say that to uh, pass it on to uh, newer generations. So we selected um, some high school students, and this was a result, a wonderful result. We haven't met them before. They have been chosen randomly. and. Well, you will see in the documentary that the ideological, well, the origin of each of these um, actors or these persons is different in nature. So the idea was that from their independence, from the uh, l lack of bias, they would answer, they would answer questions for us because we really wanted to hear what they had to say. Well, some of the questions are rhetorical. So for instance, well, if uh, a page should be turned over, whether we should continue to implement measure, whether we should continue to search for the remains. And then, well, the, uh, as a result of this documentary, they contacted with two family and also with experts such as Baltasar Garzón or Manuel Rivas that we were so, so thankful and so pleased that they decided to collaborate in this documentary. So this is the reason they took us to embark on this adventure. And well, the documentary touches upon many issues, but perhaps the background or the underlying issue is education. Education or um, the dictatorship is not taught at the schools. Well, during the dictatorship, the topic was not on the school books, but why not today? Well, it is not on school books because the topic is still open. Many people still ha are afraid of narrating or sharing or their experience these stories. So we still see a division. We still see a divide in ideological divide in Spain. And this doesn't want to be understood as an aspect, an element of humanity, but just as a, uh, ideological uh, difference, uh, but it is, we are really sorry for that, because when we listened to the people that were sharing their experience with us, we realized that it was absolutely necessary for this to happen, to speak about that, so that these people can be uh, given that voice and can use it as uh, as escape. And why not? Actually, not talking about it, it is not, uh, doesn't make sense. Well, in this documentary, we have, there are two characters, Mariquinha and Manuel, and they represent the two mainstream groups of uh, civil war, the repression, the groups that were replaced politically. One of them is a unionist. And then the groups uh, representing the pure envy, absolute envy, that was found in villages. The character believes that in the fate of his mother, 
uh, former Armaya that did not achieve what he wanted to achieve played a significant role. So do you have similar cases in your families? Well, let me qualify uh, something that you just said. This is one of the things that is being said, that Amada Garcia, the mother of Gabriel, was killed because she did not attend it, or she did not um, correspond to the uh, moves of the uh, of the person of this other person you know of his uh, supposed lover but he, she was killed because she was uh, spanish she belonged to the spanish phalange well i think or oh, she was not a member who was opposing the spanish phalange so we in all of us in our family we have a close um, relative that suffered the consequences of the civil war and the after war repercussions. In my case, the most direct case that I met was the eldest mother, a brother of my mother. He was a political commissioner of the Republican Army. He was appointed as such because there was no one other person to be appointed. Uh, he was a good communicator. Uh, he was appointed to uh, talk to, 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 the, uh, to the troops. And actually, he had a conservative ideology. Uh, his father, my grandfather, was, uh, was of a right ideology. And actually, it was a bit of a contradiction. It was a contradiction for him because sometimes he had to protect himself from other people who did not uh, like him. And actually, what I saw, what I experienced myself, was 40 years of my life. Ever since I was uh, five years of age, uh, up until the year 1975, I could feel ongoing permanent repression. Since I was a child, I always identified the presence of civil guards uh, in, at home, uh, in, at home, around in the countryside. But when we left the village, Guardia Civil was no longer there up until my uncle Gabriel showed up. So systematically, every time my uncle used to visit my mother and uh, my grandmother, the previous day, the Guardia Civil came home. And they were asking us how we were doing, where everything was right, so OK. And it was just because they were following, controlling a man who was a Catholic, a Roman Catholic, a worker of the countryside, but he had opted in uh, for the Republican legality. He had been con sentenced to death uh, several times. And that was the case for he was pardoned later on. And this was the, my, uh, what happened to me over 40 years. What I learned about the war, I learned it from him, from his narration. N never at a school or university, I was told uh, about the war. And if there was any possibility for students to learn about the world, world through the uh, subject, uh, that was approved and then removed, well, it is no longer possible to teach students on that. So here, well, other uh, countries have not hidden this, the dictatorship, but Spain has been doing so for many years. So it is necessary for the new generations to have an understanding of what happened at that time. And the good thing about this uh, short film and of the main character or the role played by the grandchildren or the great grandchildren is the permanence or the the way the memory prevails. So that need shows up generation after generation. And interesting enough, whenever the generation of the sons and daughters disappear, then the grandchildren are the ones who have the deepest need to know, because they don't understand. They don't understand why some things are happening, why the grandfather does not speak about a specific uh, stories. That was the same for me. 
So in my case, whenever we spoke about something which was sensitive, you know, my mother used to close the windows or to say, please do not speak as loud. So that stays in you. And then you want to know more, especially when you've been denied access to that explanation, to that memory. And that's the reason why this need or the wish or desire to know about what happened grows and grows. Well, they will tell us about their story, the specific situation, but I'm sure that the perception and their lives changed significantly after the documentary. So main characters of the documentary, there comes a time that you are at Marikinha's home. And Marikinha tells you that she is excited or she's moved because you are concerned about what happened to her family. So do you think that in the street, your friends, your neighbors, are uh, enough aware about this topic? Do you think that things will change if there were a greater pressure from, or from citizens? Well, as we were in the, well, as the shooting of the documentary was taking place, well, we used to mention that to our friends, and our friends were actually highly interested in it, and they were asking us lots of questions. But it was not before we mentioned that to them. Before that, well, we never discussed that, for instance, at a higher school, we never discussed anything that didn't raise any debate because, uh, well, high school uh, uh, books only devote one page to this topic. And now, because we've been involved in this project, we have, um, we have uh, s spread the words, so to speak, uh, amongst our circle of friends. It would be better or much better if the topic were much more in the streets. Do you think that the crisis has made us become more and more egotistical? Do you think that these questions sometimes are put aside when the well, there is more interest for other prosaic or more prosaic topics? Well, this is a question to you all. Well, I think that part of the problems and inconveniences, social political disturbance or lack of comfort that we enjoy in Spain comes from the past, comes from that. I honestly think that we could learn a lot. We could improve the current situation if we could learn about if we were to learn what happened uh, many years uh, before. I fully agree with you. M most of the evil things or problems that we have nowadays, of course, in politicians, many politicians would not buy into that because the Spanish transition made everything uh, happy and made everyone be happy. And actually, this is not the case. The Spanish transition helped hide everything that was related to the Franco's regime, to the actual repression, to the crimes committed under Franco's regime. It either hide it, hide it or just did not interpret it anymore, didn't go back to it, claiming that we we wanted to move forward, to look forward, to become Europeans, to become NATO members, to become less of Spaniards and to become more European. Well, playing on with the idea of Spain is different, but in a bad sense of the world. That, that could have an explanation, which I respect, but I didn't share at that time. And well, at that time, let me repeat it. It doesn't make sense that 35 years down the line, only one page is devoted to the topic, to the dictatorship or to the civil war on high school books. But I'm sure that, well, only about the civil war, but I'm sure that there is no single line written about the dictatorship. Perhaps they will mention Francisco Franco, but they will never go deeper into it. So of course, there is need. And that need, if it is brought to the present, justifies the existing interest. And there, is, there isn't a greater interest because there is no will for that interest to be there. Because on 
well, the history, this story is put aside. The victims of Franco's regime are just undermined, are, are not given the same status or the same importance of relevance as victims of terrorism. As a former magistrate judge from the Supreme Court mentioned, and now he is a lawyer of the second division. He said that the 30,000 children that were stolen at the time of the Franco's regime was a historical theory that had not been proven. And then, well, he used to be, uh, he used to have an editorial on uh, the magazine of the Valle de los Caídos. So for many, for 40 years, we had enlarged information, deeper information about the national movements, about the crusade, nationalist and fascist crusade, and systematically, all the information the other type of information has been eliminated and has only been made accessible to historians. It is not a coincidence that the first story about Franco's regime and the victims of Franco's regime appear or are for the first time mentioned by historians in 1996, and that the first exhumation is made in the year 2000 for a family of Emilio Silva. And you are an exception. You are an honorable exception because you are taking care of this topic. Of course, there is an interest as long as it would be possible to go deeper into the topic. So you've mentioned the valley of the fallen in the war. And then, well, the documentary also, also touches upon the memory sites. So you visit a place, well, I don't really want to ruin the documentary, but when you go to that place for the first time, then you see it in a different light. So why don't you think that the easiest thing uh, to do, which is, I don't know, renaming the streets, uh, bringing down some symbols, etc. why don't you think that nothing uh, like that has been Cut it out. We so, have different types of government, and uh, we have different governments of both parties. And I don't think anyone has faced anything as simple to finally terminate this problem, which I think it's pretty easy to solve. I think there is some stubbornness, which I don't understand unless it has to do with reactionary ideological reasons and it has to do with very conservative and naive governments, which is simple. Unless this is solved, the Spanish transition, transition will not be complete. Problem, Jose, is that it's not that easy. Because in order for it to be easy, those who were not in the Republic or, or the Republican side, they would need to assume there was a dictatorship. But today, still today, they don't think it is. They think it was just released. And so if you hear a conservative speaking, they refer to previous regime. They don't say it was a dictatorship. Only a few right-wing people would say during Franco's dictatorship. At most, they would say Franco's regime. But adding dictatorship to it or adjectivizing it uh, in a way that would pollute the system the system by a regime by Franco, well, that's not happening. I understand it for a bunch of citizens who are very conservative and that are ungood in the past, but once you get a government, no matter what, what wing they are, they think that they are forward-looking or left-wing, but the state has the power to make choices and solve things. That's all. But, but you need to want to, to make choices. And we could exercise it, and we'd, uh, we could ask Garajo's government and, and say, during Franco's dictatorship, I want you to say, during Franco's dictatorship, uh, rights have not been respected and still pending investigation. Well, this is a challenge. When, when you get that statement by Rajoy, you let me know. Something else that you see uh, on the documentary. 
The role of the church, how difficult some, some families find it to bury. Once they've found the remains, they have it difficult to bury those that, um, that have been shot down. It could be it's at a cemetery, but on the back, amongst 150,000 victims of Frank, Franco's regime, there were many Catholic people who wanted to have Christian funeral. But as we know, during war, uh, church said it was a crusade, and then they supported Franco along the dictatorship. Do you think church should be apologizing What's, what's your opinion when you say three ministers at a beatification event for victims of the civil war from the other side, but still no one apologizes for that list of red uh, or, or right-wing supporters uh, during dictatorship or during war? I think the church has always been where, where they could be. And they've adjusted themselves to what they could And if not even the government, not the popular party, is in a position to say or willing to say that there's been repression after a war and there was a war with a culprit, then we cannot expect the church to take sides. And it has a clear conservative nature, which is, I think, synonym of everything else. And that's why historical memory is not taken into account. The fact that there's no justice for those crimes. It, it makes sense. It just makes sense. As part of this logic that the church is not apologizing. Well, I think, and, and the problem is the following, and the documentary is very clear. And, and deals with it in a nice way. It's about training, it's about education, it's about communication, it's about having a conversation and a discussion, and doing so without any kind of precaution, not even against those who represented the ideology. I think that's what's so good about this generation lip. I might be contaminated or polluted, I might be a bit more incisive, or emotional, uh, no matter how unbiased I would like to be. But from the point of view of uh, kids, girls, boys, who are 17 to 20 plus years old, the thing is, they have no stake there, have not, has nothing to do with them. There's something different. Recovering this historic memory means that they, they might convey it through education, through training, through conversations against those who refuse even to acknowledge the situation, and that's what's so serious. It is not accepted that this is the case. It would be as making it uh, obvious. It, it, there is not an awareness that it was evil, because for 40 years it was something and became something normal. There were roads and dams and you had soccer and you had the Spanish League uh, scoring goals as heroes. And they were all there, standing there in shorts. So that's the role model. And then you get a transition when, when they said, okay, not so bad, just going forward, which is better, and it gets rid of that feeling that it is needed to have bad communication. Well, final one before the documentary for the youngest members. Will you convey this memory? Will you transfer it? Yes, I'll pass it on. We will try. The thing is, we'll have to do as soon as possible because It's, it's gone, as people are gone as well. About that, I'd like to use this opportunity to talk about Gabriel, the oldest actor who just passed away recently. So in his memory, 
This is another proof of how urgent it is to have all parts of the puzzle of memory so that it is preserved to have it as a direct testimonial from victims.